Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's program. My name is Noah Rauch. I'm the Senior Vice President for Education and Public Programs here at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. As always, we welcome our museum members and those tuning in to our live web broadcast at 911memorial.org slash live. Tonight, we are joined by Brent Velikovich, author of the memoir Drone Warrior, an elite soldier's inside account of the hunt for America's most dangerous enemies. It is an unprecedented insider's account of America's covert drone war revealing how 16 years after 9-11, technology has revolutionized America's ability to surveil, track, and eliminate terrorists. Velikovich is a US Army veteran who served five combat tours in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Somalia. As an intelligence member of a special operations task force, Brett was part of an elite group of soldiers who utilized drones to conduct counterterrorism operations. His team was responsible for the kill or capture of 14 out of America's 20 most wanted terrorists. In tonight's conversation with the museum's executive vice president and deputy director of museum programs, Cliff Shannon, Brett will discuss his story and the reality of drone warfare in today's world. We'd like to thank Brett for sharing his time and insights with us, and we're also deeply grateful to the David Berg Foundation for supporting, in part, the museum's 2017-2018 public program season. Please keep in mind that there will be a book sale and signing of Drone Warrior after the program just outside of the auditorium on our atrium terrace. And now, please join me in welcoming Brett Velikovich. Thank you, Noah. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back, many of you. And Brett, thank you so much for coming to talk about uh, your book, which is uh, really a fascinating inside account of some very difficult and intense times, but ones that seem to define the new terms of war and the new capacities that the US military has developed in recent years. Um, let's start, though, because your story in relation to the military really does begin with 9-11. And I wondered if you uh, would go back to, I think you're uh, just in the early stages of your college career, yep. and 9-11 happens, and what happens to you? Well, I think like, like everyone, you know, 9-11 upended all of us. Uh, for me, it was, uh, I was 17 years old, I was a freshman, and in college at the University of Houston, and you know, I, I knew nothing about, about this world. You know, I knew nothing about terrorism. I knew nothing really outside of you know, my small town in Texas where I grew up. And so when 9-11 happened, it just it changed everything that, that I knew. And for me, it was always, you know, you know my parents said, you, you go to school, you become a, become a banker or a doctor, that's, that's your path. And so, I, you know, that was the plan. That was always the plan. And for me, you know, just after the attacks happened, uh, I found myself just very curious to understand, you know, why there were so many people um, out there that would, that would do this against us and, and why there was so much hate against um, Americans. And so for me, I, it actually took me to the library and I just locked myself away in the library of the university and just tried to understand everything I could about Al Qaeda, and terrorism, and, and just learn from, from all this history. And for me, it was just this call, call to serve after that that made me say, you know, this is you know, what, what I was meant to do, you know, to join, join the military. And, and since then, you know, war was really all that I knew. Did you, in joining, have a particular goal in mind in terms of what part of the service you wanted to be involved with? Yeah, I mean, look, for me, it wasn't, I was never really like the tough guy, you know, in high school. You know, for me, I always felt like the, the, the best way I could give back was to join the intelligence community and be a part of it in that way. And so I felt, um, you know, instead of going in as an infantry guy or or a communications guy that intelligence was what, um, what I would do. And I had only planned really to stay in for about four or five years and get out. And it ended up being a lot longer than that because I just found um, you know, so much excitement in what I was doing and, and just this feeling that I was at the tip of the spear really, really giving, giving back. Now, one doesn't sort of just stand in a place and raise your hand and say, I want to be part of this unit that you wound up with. Um, what was the path within the military, some of which happened to you without your stepping forward to volunteer for it. They had found you in some ways. They'd observed what you were doing. What was your track that, uh, at least as far as you understand it, brought you into the intelligence side of things? Yeah, so when I finished um, intelligence school in Arizona, uh, I, I 
rose my hand and, and was one of the, the few people that decided you know, to jump out of planes. So I went to, to Fort Benning to go to airborne school. And uh, I remember my mother thinking I was crazy because I was never someone that would ever do anything like that. But for whatever reason, I just wanted to jump out of planes. And what that actually did was allow me to be uh, selected to be a part of the Special Forces organization as an intelligence support guy. And so the rest of the people who graduated me, with me from Intel school, they were all shipped off to Alaska. And uh, they formed this new, what was called a striker uh, brigade out, out there, which is an infantry unit. And um, you know, it was one of the, the better choices that I made to, to do that. And so uh, 19 years old, I was basically at uh, Fort Washington, or sorry, Fort Lewis, Washington, supporting a first special forces group, which at the time was very focused on uh, the Pacific uh, region. And so even though Afghanistan was just kicking off, I remember the Special Forces guys being really angry because they were being told to focus primarily on um, the North Korea threat mm -hmm. at the time. And you can even see today we still, we still have the threat out there. But they were mad because a lot of the other Special Forces groups around the U.S. were getting to go to Afghanistan. And, and these guys had trained their, practically their whole lives to fight, and they wanted to be a part of it. And so finally, they agreed um, to, to stop focusing on, on that area and allow them to deploy. And so I was on the first um, real deployment uh, from this group into Afghanistan and um, spent my 21st birthday there, uh, you know, just you know, thinking just how crazy it was to be there when my friends back home were all, you know, having fun and partying and, and had no idea, you know, what I was experiencing uh, being in Afghanistan. And so from there, I just kept deploying. And, and after a while, I um, you know, had done so many deployments that I started getting noticed um, by some of these more elite organizations. And one day, I got a call out of the blue to come interview for an organization that I you know, had no idea uh, what I was getting into. And just my, the same curiosity that, that got me into the Army in the first place was uh, you know, I basically signed up and said, yep, let's, uh, I'll go do it. And I, eventually was selected for, for a more um, elite group that was very focused on hunting down some of the top uh, leaders uh, within these groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS and pinpointing their location with drone technology. So let's talk a little bit about um, how those units function because you have various components that are contributing to a particular mission and a particular target. Mm -hmm. So tell us first about how you begin to build a case that someone out there is a target worth identifying, following, and then sending out a mission either to capture or kill. So there's a lot of different methodologies that go into it. Uh, what a lot of people talk about, um, and that's you know, essentially widely known, um, is, a, is a method called find, fix, and finish, and exploit and analyze. It's a cycle that takes place whereby which we are uh, taking information from the battlefield, from fighters that have been captured or killed and exploiting the information, whether it's documents that we found on them, whether it's intelligence information that we've gleaned. Uh, it can be from, come from a variety of different sources, and we use that information then to go to the next guy. You know, imagine in any organization out, that out, out there, they have a, a chain of command or essentially a, a hierarchy of that organization. We're working our way to the top. We want to we want to take out essentially the CEO of that organization, but sometimes we can't get to them. So we start from very small pieces of information, whether it's something as easy as you know maybe we know that he travels to the same um, you know donut sh donut shop every morning, and we know that he goes there from a particular point in time uh, during the day. So we can put surveillance on that location and then use that information to follow that person and have them lead us. Uh, to their hire and work their way up the chain. And it's a process that can take days and, or it's a process that when you, you know, see the Bin Laden raid can take years. Now, it's interesting. You really are seeing these terror groups as organizations with bureaucracies that within those organizations, there are people who are doing administrative stuff. There are people who are doing battle planning. There are people who are making strategic decisions. And how is it that you from above or from sources of, from the battlefield, how do you begin to piece together a case? Is it as simple as you know, putting on a chalkboard, this one does this, that one does that? So you're absolutely right. I mean, these organizations do essentially have a bureaucracy. And when you look at like a typical Al-Qaeda cell or an ISIS cell, they all really have a very similar 
um, functions within it. They'll have a guy that does their admin stuff. They'll have a person that does logistics. They'll have a military commander who's in charge of you know, planning bombs. They'll, they'll have these really regimented structures. And so you, when, you, when you're missing one of those at, out of your uh, group of individuals you're looking uh, to go after, you know that there's a gap you need to fill of intelligence information. Maybe you don't know who the military commander is of that ISIS cell that you're trying to stop from conducting an attack on a particular city and you need to find that information. And so that kind of helps us piece together the puzzles to understand you know, who to go after, um, where they may be located, who they're connected to, and really in the end how to get to the top of, of that organization. Now, from the earliest point in your training for this special uh, unit, um, it's very demanding in terms of the logic that you've got to follow and explain to the people who are training you and then you get out into the field and you really are put to the test very quickly. Uh, there's a quote you have from a special forces commander uh, who says, we're going to risk our lives because of your decisions, meaning you, the targeter. Um, you are choosing who lives or dies because you're the guy who finds the target. You're the guy who's signing a target's death warrant. So we talked a little bit about the division of labor on the terror side. What's the division of labor within a unit like yours? There are people running drones, there are people doing intelligence sweeps, there are operators who are actually going out and doing the raids, there are the targeters. How does that all work together? I mean, so look, the intelligence community is, is huge. There are a ton of different functions involved in that, and there's you know, nothing I did was ever done alone. I mean, that, that was just a fact. But there's different moving pieces of the puzzle. There's folks that deal with imagery analysis. So they take satellite uh, information, and they can provide us up-to-date photographs of of uh, locations that we're staring at. Then you've got guys that do uh, typical on-the-ground spy work that might be looking for sources on the ground. Then you have folks that do surveillance. And all that information is, is compiled um, together and it helps us kind of paint this picture. You know, typically when you hear of um, these missions that, that occur overseas, you might hear about you know, the Navy SEAL team that went and kicked down the door and, and captured that terrorist in a, in a you know, far-flung country around the world. But what you don't realize is how much intelligence actually goes in to that for that to happen. How does that Navy SEAL know exactly where to be at that point in time where that terrorist is going to be located? And that's what the intelligence community does, and that's what we did from a targeting standpoint was our job was to tell them that individual that we're going after is in this house, He's surrounded by a bunch of bodyguards. They all have weapons. He has you know, two or three children, a wife. You're, we're, we're filling in the picture so that they know exactly what they're getting into. I mean, even down to the minute detail of which way does the door handle open so that when they, they go in there, they don't get stuck. Or you know, where are their windows? Or with drone technology, we can see a lot of things that, that people can't see from the naked eye. So we could literally even tell potentially um, you know, what part of the house people are located uh, because of the type of signature they exhibit through, through the drone, drone camera. So um, the detail and precision involved in, in this type of stuff is just absolutely incredible. And it comes down to really uh, a lot of changes that happened, quite frankly, after 9-11, where these intelligence agencies came together and started sharing information uh, versus kind of holding it together and saying, you know, the FBI saying, no, this is my information, or the CIA saying, no, you know, we've got this, you can't handle it. Everyone's now come together and they've shared that information uh, for the greater good. Now, what does the drone do for you? Uh, you? You were there, you weren't flying the drone, but you were getting the data from the drone and with your colleagues sort of putting this picture together of mm -hmm. your target. What is the capacity of the drone and what makes it different than other forms of surveillance that might have been available before? So the great thing about drones is that they really have the, uh, the ability to just loiter above an area for hours at a time, now days at a time. So literally we can be watching something um, and uh, w which before, you know, an airplane could maybe stay in the air for four or six hours at a time, had to leave, very, it was very expensive. You have people in the plane. Now a drone can stay up in the air for for just an incredible amount of time and watch minute details. So when I was watching these targets, I was literally you know, watching them wake up in the morning, watching them take their kids to school, and at the same time I was falling asleep with them. I mean, we would pipe in the video feeds from the drone cameras into our 
where our, our living quarters. So I would literally go to sleep at night watching these guys go to sleep and so I, I, that I knew I could sleep as well. And so that what the technology does is it gives us the ability to go on the offensive. I think a lot of times for years we've always been so reactionary to attacks, uh, terrorist attacks that have occurred. Um, and that's a lot of times, you know, the reason for that is we just haven't had the, the foresight to, 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 to know where these, we, we know that somebody is, try, is threatening us, we just don't know how to find them and stop it before it happens. Um, think about the way that wars have been fought for generations. You know, um, Vietnam or World War II. You didn't know necessarily that the guy in, in the trench 100 yards away from you, you didn't know who he was. You just knew he was coming to kill you. You, you don't know who that person is. You just knew you had to kill him first before he, he hurt your, you know, the people around you or yourself. With drone technology, we can actually see who that is. We can see them from different angles. We can make a conscious decision whether or not uh, this person should be captured or they should be killed. And I think a lot of times there's this narrative that exists that that technology takes you away from the fight. But I think on the contrary, I mean, you're seeing more than you would have ever, ever seen normally uh, when, when going after some of these individuals that we hunted down. Let me refer to one of those individuals. Uh, we can talk about a couple of these cases, but um, it was, I think, as you describe in the book, a very significant moment for you in terms of the first of the targets who wound up being killed because you had determined that this was a target who was um, responsible for coordinating suicide attacks in the northern part of Iraq. And um, you gave him a nickname or a code name of Scarface. Take us through, if you would, the development of the targeting on this person, how you first learned that this might be someone who posed a threat, how you developed this case against him, and then what happened in terms of the information that you had processed and turned it over to the special forces operators. Yeah, so Scarface was an interesting uh, target, and, and if you read the book, you'll know why we call, uh, call him that, because of um, the way he went out in the end, which is um, very interesting. But um, the reason we uh, determined he was a target was it goes back to this structure of how groups like ISIS function. So we knew that um, there was uh, a commander uh, that, uh, uh, that generally is in charge of all of Mosul, Iraq, uh, and, and sometimes uh, south down to Tikrit, the Tikrit area. So we know that there's an overall ISIS commander that's in charge of thousands of fighters. Um, and so because you know, the, drone, the drones that we're utilizing are some of the most sophisticated things in the U.S. government's arsenal. There's only so many of these drones that exist. So we're not going after these lower level guys that may be implanting bombs in the road and, and you know, horrible people as it is. We, we're going after like their boss's boss's boss. So, so this guy in particular, we said, you know, we know this individual exists, we just don't know who it is. Well, we had captured, um, what, what, what we call an administrative emir. So essentially an ISIS commander who's in charge of like the paperwork and paying fighters and dealing with all the oil profits. We had captured him and he provided us the name to this overall commander of, of Northern Iraq, uh, you know, who we codenamed Scarface. And so that basically told me, all right, this is my next target, I need to find this guy. So using a variety of different intelligence methods, um, we were able to pinpoint his location just south of uh, this area called Beji, which is a massive oil refinery where ISIS has stolen millions and millions of oil uh, and, and, sold, and, and sold it off. And he was, he was there because he was there to collect a ton of funds uh, for ISIS. But we pinpointed him to a location. And this was one of those cases where he was such a big target that me as, as being in charge of that, that uh, operation uh, from the intelligence side, this is where we determine whether or not we should actually take this person out, conduct a raid that night, or follow that individual because he's going to be connected to the number one, the number two, the number three in the organization. He's, su he's such a high-ranking guy. So um, from our standpoint, you know, I said, let's follow this guy around. You know, let's, let's see where he leads us and, ho and spend day, we were going to spend days essentially following him around and and mapping out his locations. And, and then once we decided to go after him, we would hit all those other locations with raids and hopefully it would turn up uh, some of the more senior level commanders as well. Well, um, what happened on that particular occasion is as we pinpointed him, because we all are connected uh, within our organizations that are targeting in different parts of the country, 
another group of uh, uh, special operations guys, rangers, um, they were watching the same drone feed um, that, that I was using, that I was using to target, and they knew that um, we had found Scarface, and they were maybe 10 minutes away from this location that Scarface was at. So they took it upon themselves to go barreling through uh, his, his location, his house, you know, crashing through the compound walls and surrounding the house and demanding uh, Scarface, uh, you know, come out and surrender. Uh, but Scarface being the, uh, you know, evil person he is, you know, at that level they generally go out with a fight. And so he just began, he basically sent his, his wife and his kids out of the house and he took all the weapons, compiled them um, in, uh, in his compound and he just started just spraying and praying, you know, shooting out the windows and um, shooting at the rangers. And of course, you know, these rangers are, you know, very, very well trained. And so, um, but after about, you know, 10 rockets shot into that house, um, they finally, um, they finally stopped, stopped him. But um, that was, you know, one of many, we were doing that every single night. I mean, we were going, we were doing these missions over and over and over again. And that was one um, instance where uh, we got, you know, higher level uh, commander that we were going after. If the, um if, if, you're, if a unit is in place and conducting a raid, are you still in contact with them during the point at which they're moving on a target to let them know in real time what's happening as best you can see it inside that target area? Yeah, so generally uh, part, of, part of what I did essentially as an as a analyst is my job was to present information to uh, you know, the SEALs, the Green Berets of the world, and let them know what they were getting into. So I can do that because I'm getting a ton of information from, from our, our drone live feed. We're presenting that to them. Even on the way out, we're letting them know uh, who uh, might even be found with them on, on targets and things like that. But um, while as they're, they're heading towards the, 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 the location that they're going to strike, they're constantly getting updates from us at our command center letting them know Listen, you know, this, th these are some of the things that are changing. Uh, here's what you need to look out for. Maybe some people showed up uh, so that they are constantly in contact with, um, with uh, you know, what's going on in the field. You know, it's, it's, um, it's fascinating to think that you're conducting a mission like this, but in other centers of U.S. forces, let's take Iraq or Afghanistan, but wherever, really, that there are others doing the same thing. So there are multiple missions being planned and conducted simultaneously, you talk here about drones and this intelligence and surveillance capacity as really creating a different kind of warfare. This is a new generation of war fighting. Do you think that we will now integrate into any aspect of our war fighting, not just special forces and those very targeted raids, but any aspect of our war fighting, this kind of drone surveillance capacity. Can you imagine that this is not going to be everywhere in the military? Right, look, we will never fight another drone, or we will never fight another war without drone technology, hands down. And that tells you how, how important it is. It used to be, you know, special forces guys, they'd go out uh, in the field and they didn't care about having surveillance above them. They'd go hang out in the, uh, in the, in the bush for weeks at a time and they'd conduct their mission, they'd come back home. But now, after 9-11, uh, the technology has provided so much insight to the warfighter and it's allowed uh, them to you know, save lives that would have otherwise been lost had they not been able to see what was ahead of them, uh, that they'll, it will always be used in that capacity. And these defense contractors now, they can't churn out enough drones because so many people need them. You know, the first drone I ever, I ever laid my hands on was in Afghanistan, 2003. Um, and it was 2004, rather, and it was uh, what was called a Raven. It was a little sm small drone about this big. It was meant to be uh, carried on a, uh, the back of an infantry guy, and essentially you'd throw it up in the air, and you would uh, be able to see maybe five to 10 kilometers of what's in front of you. And I remember uh, you know, the, the guys that I, that I were with that, that, had, that had this drone, they invited me over to, to come fly it for the first time, and I was just, you know, just amazed by the, the technology. And that was very rare for anyone to have, to have a drone. I mean, this was, this, was a, this was very rare technology to have at the time. And so 
Um, you know, I, I threw it up in the air. They gave me the controls. I'm zipping it around, you know, as it really hard to control at the time, really loud, just buzzing like a sound of, you know, bees out there. And I just remember thinking like, you know, how incredible it was, but at the same time, like if I was the enemy, I could see this coming for miles. And um, then they, told, they said, okay, go ahead and land it. You know, I'm like, okay, I have no idea how to land this thing, but I guess I'll, I'll do my best. And so when I came in to land, I basically just crashed it right into, right into the concrete. And it just busted open and broke everywhere. And this is a two, three hundred thousand dollar drone. I mean, it's a pocket drone, but this is a lot of money. And, you know, I'm a young, you know, I think at the time I was like a young private in, in the army still. And uh, I'm just thinking like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to pay for this the rest of my life. <laughs> and uh, th then, you know, the, the special forces guys just, they just saw the fear in my eyes and uh, they just started laughing at me because they're like, look, this drone is meant to break apart upon impact. That's, it's meant to do that so that if the enemy ever finds it, uh, they can't put it back together. They won't know how to put it back together. And uh, so now that now that very that same very drone, the Raven is you know pretty much every infantry company that's out there in the army has one of these. So it's proliferated so much now over the years that um, what used to be technology that was only reserved for the, the elite of the elite are now across the board um, helping you know do things more than simply just counterterrorism. I mean, you've got even army engineers using these things to help them build bridges. Mm. So. Long way, long story, but to you no, know, right. to get to the point of, we will we will absolutely fight every single war now with with drone technology because of how useful it is. That raises the question, of course. I mean, some of it's commercially available, and the technology keeps improving. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So the other side gets drones too. Are we? Do you think able to maintain the qualitative edge? Certainly, we should against terrorist groups or non-governmental groups. But there's also the whole possibility of other states and their development of drone capacities. Yeah, it's very dangerous. Actually, a story just came out, I think, this week that uh, it was a brilliant title that said, you know, is, uh, are the Chinese about to start selling the AK-47 of drones? Mm. And what that meant essentially was the Chinese developed a predator-like drone that they started saying they were going to sell to just about anyone that could afford the price tag. We've always been, uh, had, had uh, as, as America, the ability to have the best you know, UAVs out there. I mean, and, and people want these drones from us. They want predators and reapers, but we won't sell them to, to them because of how incredible the technology is. But now you've got uh, you know, these, these countries, you know, China and Russia, that can basically uh, build, build them or have either stolen the, tech, the, the plans for how we built them or just have figured out how to create it themselves um, without that. And now they're looking at proliferating it. So it's very dangerous from that standpoint. But at the same time, now consumer drone technology is uh, getting to the point where it rivals some of the same stuff I had access to in the military. I deal a lot now with consumer drone tech because of the fact that I'm adapting it in, in other ways, um, uh, not just for war. But the fact is like, you know, you'll see these ISIS, ISIS now, They're, they've been using drones, consumer drones you can buy $500 a pop, they stick a grenade on it, They've been flying them over Raqqa, or they're flying them over Mosul, and they've been dropping them on Iraqi or coalition forces. And that's, that's dangerous when someone can pick up something that anyone can buy off, off of Amazon and weaponize it. Um, we got to do something about it, because it, it's not going to end. Are there defensive measures that we can take against something like that? I think there are. I think it's slow moving. Um, there's a number of different countermeasures that are being developed. Uh, but we're a long way away from being able to zap a drone out of the sky, mm -hmm. that's for sure. But there are technologies that are being developed that can determine uh, the speed and trajectory at which a drone is traveling. Uh, they've, they've put uh, in some military bases overseas now these systems that can detect if a consumer drone is, is headed their way so that they could create a defensive posture for it. Uh, but knowing what I know about uh, you know, drones and consumer drones, it's pretty hard right now, unfortunately, to be able to stop uh, an, an attack from somebody that just simply wants to do harm. And, and that's, that's, I think, the scary part about it. You know, one of the things you write about um, in terms of the uh, Iraqi experience you had was the human intelligence that was provided that allowed you to flesh out pictures of uh, some of the targets that you were developing information on. Uh, intelligence from Iraqis who were sympathetic to our side and who saw the threat from some of the people you were targeting. 
the, you came to know these folks as cougars. Um, talk a little bit about how that material came to you, was integrated into the profile, what risks some of the Iraqis took to yeah. provide this information. No, there's just uh, just an incredible amount of uh, people uh, that are out there in countries like Iraq, Afghanistan, that were local citizens that you would think, you know, maybe they wouldn't be happy that U.S. troops were, were there, and yet they wanted nothing more than to help root out terrorism within their country. And uh, so we oftentimes partner with, uh, essentially, they call them local partner forces that are out there because I can't walk into the middle of Baghdad without being noticed, you know, so these guys can go in there and they can, they can do surveillance, they can take photos, they can get into places that we wouldn't otherwise be able to go. And uh, a lot of them um, sacrifice, you know, everything to protect their own families. Um, and uh, it was, there were just a number of different people that I remember that, that risked their lives to really help, um, help, help the cause. You also found yourself tracking families. That was a way to get at some of the targets and understand how they move, where they might come home to, these kinds of things. Um, it raises the question, of course, of targeting not just of an individual who might be a threat, but the risk of harm to wife, children, extended family around him. Um, this extraordinary power that we have also has this terribly sharp cutting edge to it. And uh, the term collateral damage is a horrible term, mm -hmm. but it's come to be described, it's come to describe civilian casualties through military action. What was your experience with this kind of, of incident? Were there casualties, family type casualties of some of the things that you undertook? <clears throat> Did you s deliberately not do things because of the risk of such casualties? Yeah, I mean, our, our job was to be precise. My job was to be right. And uh, of course, you know, whenever there's, there has been a loss of life, um, it's, it's, it's tragic. These are the things that keep us up at night. You know, we didn't, we didn't sign up, uh, we signed up to hunt terrorists. We didn't sign up to hurt innocent people. Um, but I cannot, I, I can personally tell you many times when I was hunting an individual and we let them live another day because we were so worried about a woman or a child being hurt in the process. And I can't remember a single time that a commander made the decision to conduct a drone strike and launch that missile knowing that a child or, or a woman uh, would be hurt in the process, um, or a non-combatant, rather. And that still holds true today with, with how drone strikes um, take place. There is this, this um, you know, this understanding that you have this near certainty that a non-combatant will not be killed in the process. But of course, mistakes happen. Uh, but again, those are the things that, that keep us up at night. We didn't just go on with our day and say, oh, well. I mean, we, there's a serious amount of accountability within our organizations. A lot of times, you know, I have these uh, conversations with folks that are against the drone program, and that's, that's fine, you know. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's understandable, the, you know, the opinions they have, whether or not they're misinformed because they don't have the information that's, that's here nor there. But a lot of times I talk to them specifically about just the, how, how precise uh, we try to be and that, you know, what's the alternative, you know, with going after these people. I mean, what is the review like after an incident like that where mm -hmm. you know there have been civilian casualties? What happens internally to your group? So what will happen is, uh, you know, investigations will occur um, to understand exactly uh, what, what happened, who made the decision, what went wrong, um, why we didn't know that, um, uh, you know, a child was, was a part of this. Um, but this, uh, the accountability is, is very strong. You know, we like to say in our organization that we had enough rope essentially to hang ourselves with. They, they gave us a lot of room to do our job because they knew that they had some of the best people on the planet, the best people trained to do this job. But at any point you slip up, you're out, you're gone. And so um, besides the fact that we knew we had uh, the uh, operators, the, you know, the, the door kickers' lives in our hands by sending them out on these, on these raids, uh, we also know that, that, yeah, we call them targets, but these are real people. These are human beings that we're dealing with. And we may be looking at, at them from you know, 20,000 feet in the air, but at the same time, like, these are real lives that are being affected. And so the accountability is, is, um, is, is very important. 
uh, there and, and there's just, you know, an investigation that occurs and if, if, if there was fault, you know, then the person's gone. The other side of the coin is a story you tell and I won't come to the conclusion, just set you up to tell a little bit about it, of a man you were tracking who had two children in a car. Yeah, so I, look, I saw a lot of terrible things. I mean, when you're watching people all day long, like think about all the things you do when you don't think other people are watching. You know, like that's what we saw. So, um, all right, we're know. gonna stop the program right here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in this particular case, it was, it was a terrible you know, ordeal. We, we were following a guy uh, that we knew was tied to um, Al Qaeda in Iraq. And one day we saw him go, you know, pick up what we believed to just be his children, um, a little girl and a, and a little boy and put him in the back seat uh, of his car. And it was just another day we were gonna fo follow this, this guy around and figure out you know, maybe if he could lead us to other, other targets. He pulls up uh, in, in a neighborhood and uh, basically a, a massive market uh, with the vehicle. He gets out, gets out of the car, children are still inside, and he runs uh, basically, he walks essentially through the market. And you know, we think you know, he's going to the store to pick something up. And, you know, a minute later, the car explodes. And what he had done was he had basically driven that vehicle into that market and he used the kids as a diversion so that the security forces wouldn't check his vehicle for explosives. And he used them as a mechanism to, to, to get away with, with murdering, you know, a lot of other people. And those are the people we hunted down. I mean, these weren't, these weren't people that robbed a, you know, liquor store or stole a pack of cigarettes from the, the corner store. Like, these are some of the most evil people on the planet. And they deserved everything they had coming to them. Were they aware or did their awareness grow over time of their susceptibility to being surveilled and watched from above? Yeah, I mean, we made them paranoid. I mean, our, our teams made them paranoid. We had, uh, we would get information that, uh, you, know, everyone, you know, everyone in ISIS needs to, you know, if you're driving around in a vehicle, you need to get one with a sunroof so you can go look up in the sky and see if there's a drone overhead. Or, or you know, if, you, if you're driving for a while, uh, you know, in, in Iraq, get out of the car and stop and, and look around to see if you can hear the drone. And, you know, we know this, so we're not f flying right over top of them, you know, staring at them or flying low enough for them to hear us. We, we understand their methodologies to the T. Um, at the same time, I remember at one point we were, we were capturing so many of them that uh, they, were, they were telling themselves to stop wearing wristwatches into their meetings because they thought we could track them somehow by their Seiko, you know, time watch. You know, but that's, that's actually, that's a good thing for the, that's a good thing that we've made them so paranoid uh, and afraid of this that uh, it makes them slip up and it, it makes it so that they can no longer hold meetings as casually as they would before. And so every time they make a mistake, we're there. And the U.S. government doesn't forget, you know, for decades, all these fighters that are over there that think they got away with it, they're, they're on a list somewhere mm -hmm. and they'll eventually be found, whether it's, whether it's this month or years from now. So, I mean, stimulating paranoia or concern is also a way of limiting their effectiveness. And if they're looking exactly. behind themselves, they're not looking forward. Exactly, it's a, it's a preemptive measure to, to stop them from, from being able to move freely. Now, you alluded to it before in this moment, you talked about you know, going to bed with the soundtrack of your drone tracking who's sleeping elsewhere. But uh, you describe life in the box, which is the name that was given to the command center that you had. And it was, to say the least, very intense. And I think your tours were four months long because uh, obviously someone decided it was really enough just to be in there for that long. Because it sounds like four months were pretty much 24 seven with some sleep when you could get it stuck in. So describe what that environment and that atmosphere was like and what it did to you. Yeah, I think it, it, it creates this, uh, you know, psychological, uh, yeah. When you're, we were at the, we were, we were hunting these guys down every single day and knowing that I had this, this power uh, to, to do something about terrorist attacks or, or, or all these threats that we face as a country, that keeps you up at night. You never want to stop. And that can be, uh, you know, just uh, wear on you over and over again doing that for days. I would go for days without sleeping because I just didn't want to miss a thing. You know, when you think about the box, it might be as big as this room, you know, where we'd, we'd have 
10 TVs on the wall. Think about walking into a Best Buy and seeing a ton of TVs on the wall. Like that's essentially what the box was. We had multiple drones up at the same time following multiple targets. You know, there was never a moment's rest. If, if, one, if one guy you know, went, uh, you know, stopped at a market or, and went inside and, and was having tea, we had another drone following another individual and maybe he was doing something different. And so after a while of doing that for months on end, they literally forced us to, to go home uh, because doing that for four or five months at a time is just, uh, just wearing. I would come back from these deployments you know, 50, 60 pounds lighter. People would barely recognize me. They started calling me Casper because I was so white, you know, and like my family didn't recognize me. You know, I, and then I'd come back home and I'd want nothing more than to go back over. Right, you seats. weren't very good at coming home. No, I hated it, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and I, but I loved every minute of what I did and I wanted nothing more to, than to be a part of that. And you kind of lose friends and family in the process because one, you can't tell them, you can't tell them what you're doing, you know, at that time. And you can't, you can't, the only people you can really talk about this stuff to are like the people uh, that are doing this work with you. And so they really become your family. So you can't even hold a normal conversation with, you know, your girlfriend or your mother. It's, it's, it becomes this uh, just boring conversation because they had no idea what you just experienced. And in your mind, you're just cycling through all these targets and how, and you're thinking, how can I get to the next one? Like, oh, I just, you know, in every deployment, there's one guy we missed. So that's the one you're always thinking about. The next deployment, how can we get him? And so uh, you, know, you do that for years, it can change you. You um, went out at a certain point and then you went back in. And so what was the, I mean, you, you were trying to break mm -hmm. and yet you couldn't break at that point. You wanted still to stay in the fight. I mean, it sounds like from your descriptions of the relationships with your colleagues, I mean, this is a brotherhood or familyhood, if you will, because there are women who are also uh, in the box who are part of this, um, that at some point seems unbreakable to you in terms of where your first commitment must be. Yeah, for me, it was always, you know, put the needs of the country over, over my own. Um, I, but at the same time, seeing every single day the, you know, the, the, the benefits of what you're doing, uh, that's uh, not many people, I think, in the intelligence community nowadays get to see uh, when, they, when they create a, a report or they, they find maybe a, a threat or terrorist that we need to go after. A lot of times that information, they write the report and it just goes up into the big brain that is the U.S. government and maybe, uh, you know, the president or a congressman or whoever, they look at that and they use it, you know, for some of the stuff that they do. What I was doing was every single day we were capturing or killing, you know, people, some of the most evil people on the planet. I was seeing that over and over. And so even though um, th that's, you know, you, every, every, a, a lot of businesses, they say, you know, come work for us. You know, you'll see how great you're, you know, you're, you're doing and what you're achieving. And then after a while, you know, I found this in the civilian sector was that, you know, I look back and I'm like, what am I, what am, what am I accomplishing from everything that I'm, I'm doing here? And that was the one job that I could see my accomplishments firsthand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there's one who got away, uh, who we still read about in the news, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who is the emir of ISIS mm -hmm. and uh, who had been reported dead but turned out not to be dead. You were tracking him at one point, and uh, so you had a bead on him, and then he disappeared. Tell us that story. Yeah, so at the time, uh, so the, the current leader of ISIS right now is a man named Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. A lot of people associate him as the, you know, the original founder of ISIS. He actually wasn't the original leader of ISIS. The original leader um, was a guy named Abu Umar al-Baghdadi, uh, and he kind of shared the, uh, the group's leadership responsibilities with a, a guy named Abu Ayyub al-Mazri, who was this Egyptian um, al-Qaeda in Iraq guy. So, my job, along with other, other folks that were working this mission set, was to capture or kill those two individuals, the, the leaders of the Islamic State. But at the time, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, he was maybe number three or four in the overall organization. Uh, and we discovered him because of, uh, we started just, you know, just getting all these interrogation reports and all this information about this guy, you know, this guy who's come on the scene very quickly, got out of prison, he seems to have a lot of command and, you know, WASDA essentially, uh, which is very rare. A lot of times when, when Al-Qaeda or ISIS fighters got released from prison, that they always kind of were put on ice for a while because they thought they were turned somehow by the U.S. government. So I knew that 
Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi likely had a lead to finding the number one and number two at the time. This is uh, 2010, uh, March, April 2010. So we started hunting Baghdadi in hopes that he would take us to the original leaders who had not been seen for almost four or five years. Well, um, we, we, we find a number of uh, different leads to him, including some of his family members. So we, uh, we arrest his, his brothers and we put him in prison and we interrogate him. We get all this information about, about uh, kind of filling in the details of who Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is. And what we realize is that he, create, he actually created uh, this courier network uh, that uh, allowed him to pass letters to the number one and number two. And only he uh, and a few other guys understood who were the individuals that actually physically would take those letters uh, to, uh, to the number one and number two, wherever they were hiding around Iraq. And so we figured, let's find him and we'll you know, find Baghdadi and we'll find the number one and number two. So we found a location for Baghdadi in Baghdad, um, and uh, we conduct a raid at his location, thinking uh, that he, we believed he was in the house. We get there, and he's not there. But uh, this individual is there, uh, that's uh, uh, this guy that was a kind of a former Iraqi officer, intelligence officer, and he ha turns out to be one of these couriers, one of these three couriers that filled a, a, a long chain uh, that led to where the number one and number two were. And, he sa and we said, where's Baghdad? And he said, you just missed him. He was here 10 minutes ago. So, you know, we literally had the chance to get uh, Baghdad in, in 2010. But what that raid actually allowed us to do was we used that courier uh, and we turned him to uh, follow him, use drones to follow him to the next courier. And Baghdadi set up that network, you know, fairly cleverly. He didn't tell the first cur he only told the first courier who the second courier was, but the third courier didn't know who the first one was. So we had to spend, the only way we could have got to these guys literally was with drones. I mean, there, I can't think of another way we could have done it because the, they didn't know each other. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we took that letter that that courier was holding that Baghdadi had written uh, for the number one and number two, and we, we put uh, drones over the courier, and we said, go meet your next guy. I'm sure, you know, a few days later, he went and met him. So we followed that guy. Once he handed off the letter, we followed him. Then he handed off the letter to another individual. We followed him. And eventually, out of the, the three couriers, the last one, you know, took a, took a you know, half a day trip out into the middle of the desert, uh, just north of Tikrit, Iraq, and to a small little tiny hut. And we said, that's, that's got to be where they are. So we conducted a mission. Uh, and uh, the number one and number two leaders were hiding in a hole like Saddam Hussein was in a spider hole, and they got into a massive firefight. Uh, the two leaders had suicide vests on, so they actually pulled the, uh, the cord on their vests uh, during the firefight, blew themselves up so they couldn't be captured, killed their own child in the process that was there, uh, and uh, that was the end of them. But what it did was it, it allowed Baghdadi to fill the ranks, and now, you know, we have... ISIS and what it is today with, with him being number but one. ISIS has been greatly reduced. We see about the fall of Raqqa just uh, yesterday or today. And the methods seem to have carried over in terms of the things you've been describing in Iraq, Afghanistan as well, but we've been focusing on Iraq. But the same technology seems to have been very effective in terms of extending this war into Syria and reducing ISIS's footprint there. It's effective to an extent. I mean, this is, when I, when I left Iraq, uh, late 2010, we had brought ISIS to the brink of extinction. So we thought. We had put thousands of fighters away in prison. You know, s good soldiers lost their lives putting these fighters in prison. And we, when, we got, when we left and U.S. forces were told to pull out, um, the Iraqi government, Prime Minister Maliki at the time, said, you know, release all the fighters. He bas they, basically called, they basically called our operations center and they said, who are the top 50 guys that are in prison right now? Because we're going to release all the rest. And I said, 50? I mean, we were capturing 50 a week. Mm -hmm. There are thousands of these guys. And so those same fighters, you know, went straight back to what they, they, they did best. And we, at the time, thought we had brought them to the brink of extinction. And we pulled out thinking, Iraq's safe. Don't worry about it. And, um, and obviously, you saw what happened. And so I worry that, yes, we've captured Mosul. We've, catch, we've captured Raqqa. ISIS is getting, again, to, to it looks like they're getting close to their demise. But 
You know, Baghdadi is one of the smartest terrorists I've ever hunted. I mean, this guy knows how to adapt. I think if, if we don't get him very soon, we'll find him on another battlefield, like in North Africa. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be very, very careful that we don't sit there and say, we, we're done, we've won. And we have, to, we have to go after, you know, till every single one of them is gone. And we can't, we can't you know, walk away from that fight and stop supporting, um, you know, these, these forces out there that we're working with. You um, describe in the environment in the box, it's a very flat hierarchy, and, and um, you were not a senior officer in terms of your rank within the military, but it came to you to make targeting decisions that were not the province of your superior officers. I mean, how did that work? Because it doesn't seem like the military hierarchy was really fully in place in that environment. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the organization I was in, um, you know, rank was relatively immaterial. We didn't wear rank. We didn't walk around saying, listen to me, I'm an officer, you're a sergeant. It didn't matter. All that mattered is, is um, what, you know, how you operated, how you thought. You're only as good as your last deployment. You had a reputation that you built because of that. And uh, typically in the military, you think of this hierarchy structure. You know, and, but we didn't care about that because it didn't matter. All, all that mattered was going after these guys. And so if you, you had what it took to do that, then you had what it took to, to hunt them down. Um, it just rank, rank didn't play a role in that because it was, it was a distractor from the mission. What was your interaction like with the special forces operators, the guys who were going out and doing the raids? Were they coming in and trying to track the intelligence with you or did you give them a complete package of information and then off they went? How yeah. did that work? Yeah, I mean, these are, these are a great group of guys. They're, they're funny to, to work with, but uh, some of them like to understand the intelligence. They like to understand every little detail about uh, the, the targets we're going after, down to their family and hair color, eye color, all that stuff. Other guys, they, they didn't care. They just, wanted, they just wanted you to tell them you know, where he was and are, there, are they gonna walk into that house and find a bunch of guys with AK-47s pointed at them. And uh, I remember you know, one day, I remember the first time I went drinking with one of them. You know, they'll tell you a lot of very interesting stories. But the one of the, one of the things that I'll never forget is the op, this operator said to me, "Is like I don't care. I don't care about who we're going after. You know that better than than I ever will. My job is is to hunt them down. But all I care about is getting back to my family alive." Mm -hmm. And that stuck with me because it, that that was another thing that would, you know speaks to that these people's lives are in my hands because I'm the one saying this person needs to die today, you know. And and so they're trusting in me that that I'm telling them the right information. Uh, but uh, a lot of them like to, you know, uh, you know, not deal with the intel and, and, and not just like I would never tell them to, how to kick down a door. I'd never tell them how to shoot a weapon because they're, you know, these guys are the best of the best at that. You did leave. And what was the decision behind going out and leaving this behind you? Because it is compelling. You did have a strong sense of mission. You had accomplishments there and obviously building a reputation and career and yet you decided to stop. Yeah, I think there are a lot of things. For me, mostly it was I took a step back and I looked and I said, um, you know, am I gonna be doing this the rest of my life? You know? um, I went to this funeral of one of the guys who died overseas and I remember thinking, just seeing like, just that I had no emotion at all. I mean, I just, you know, it was just like, doing this for months and years at a time, I just became so desensitized to this life. And I just wondered kind of, you know, who, you know, does my family even know me anymore? Do they even remember me? And so uh, I joined, you know, again, I joined also at a relatively young age. I mean, but at the same time, all I knew was war. So I was worried about the civilian world and how, how uh, if they would understand the, some of the things I went through. And, and so I said, you know, I decided to give it a try and got out and went, um, got my degree and started trying to find my place in this world. And I found, obviously, that I had a lot of knowledge about drone technology. And uh, at the time, it was becoming, um, uh, starting to be used a lot more in the civilian sector and the consumer space. And so I got uh, approached by uh, some really incredible folks that wanted me to basically teach them how I could use the same technology for war and use it for wildlife conservation. So, um, and I was, you know, me being curious, I was like, of course, let's go figure out how we can do this. And so we flew out to Africa and spent months out there trying to understand 
how uh, drones can be used to, to save uh, endangered species. And what we found was that, uh, you know, these guys out there that are poaching these animals and killing these elephants and selling their tusks and killing rhinos and, and smuggling out their horns, they're just like a insurgency, just at a rudimentary level. They're not, they're not ISIS with RPGs and all these fancy weapons, but, you know, they're out there, uh, you know, hunting down, you know, these, these animals and, and, and crushing this ecosystem that exists. And so for me, I really found a lot of, I found a passion in being able to help people through my knowledge of drones and use it for um, you know, greater good. Has it had a material impact on certain areas where the drone protection plan is in place for some of these animals? Yeah, well, a lot of, what's great about, in the military, we're using drones a lot of, a lot of times. Uh, we didn't want people to see where the drones were, all right? We didn't want them to know we were following them. With something like this, it's actually good that the poachers know that they're walking into a conservation and drones are flying around. We want them to hear it. We fly them lower, and it's it's a deterrent, mm -hmm. and so so that's a good thing. But uh, you know, it's Africa, so everything moves very slow. And so uh, part of the part of the thing that we uh, finally convinced uh, the Kenyan government to to do was uh, get them to uh, actually legally allow drones to fly out there, which is just. Uh, for years, they weren't they weren't doing that because they were worried about something hitting one of their planes mm -hmm. or hurting a tourist or, or whatever. And now they finally, as of February, said, "We see the benefits of this technology." And so now a number of conservations are getting drones and, and doing the same thing. So is that really where the bulk of your activity is now in sort of these civilian applications? Of yeah, I spend pretty much all my time now doing the humanitarian space mm -hmm. um, stuff. We just. Uh, last uh, last month, uh, my wife and I, we went out to uh, help with Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma. We brought a bunch of drones out there to help some of the first responders uh, fly uh, over some of the, the floodwaters, help people understand the damage to their homes. So I'm always looking for these projects um, that I can kind of lend my, my time to and, and really help un help them understand the benefits of the tech. Another, another group we work with is... Uh, uh, essentially a Doctors Without Borders group that goes into some of the, the, the cesspools of the world, the, the more dangerous spots, and they provide medical aid, and they need drones to help do surveillance around their, their camp because they're in some pretty dangerous areas. And we built a drone program for them, so that, uh, and we gifted them drones, and, and now they're, they're using them regularly. And so uh, 2.3 million drones were sold last year alone. They're talking about 3 million this year. We're gonna see a lot more of these things in the sky. Remarkable. Let's see if we have a couple of questions from the audience before we wrap up. And I will ask you, sorry over there, Michael, but hang on one minute. We'll get you a mic and ask you to take it and stand up when you get it. So we have one mic that's not working, it seems. And now Danny will come with the mic from the other side. Thanks. And that, that last point you were making about the number of drones that are in the sky, can you just talk a minute about the dangers that are involved with civilian and commercial aircraft and uh, yep. you know, drones getting in the way? Sure, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great point. Uh, a lot of folks, well, for a while, for the last probably year, I've been saying, well, you know, you know people always are worried about a drone hitting an air, airplane. And I've been saying, well, there's, that's never happened. So why are we all, you know, freaking out about that? But literally this last week, a drone crashed into an airliner in Canada, and uh, a drone hit an army helicopter two weeks before, actually over New York City, that was flying for uh, the president's UN speech. And so it's brought a lot more people saying, like, how can we make this technology safe, but at the, si at the same time useful to help people? And so uh, there are a number of different. Uh, companies out there that are building tech to, to ensure the safety. One, a lot of consumer drones now are made by a company, a lot of the ones people buy are made by this company called DJI, which has uh, what's called geofencing built into it. So if you flew that drone around an airport within a, a few miles of, of that airport, the drone wouldn't even take off, wouldn't even be able to launch. Or if you were flying that drone into the airport, it would actually act essentially as a virtual fence and it would stop it from flying in there. Now the problem is not every uh, drone manufacturer has that technology built into it, but that's one way that I think uh, people can can help help with that. Uh, there's also a lot of counter what they call counter UAS uh, solutions that are being developed as well. Uh, I was on literally on the news talking about a gun that can shoot electromagnetic waves at a drone and 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 basically make it think 
that spoof it to make it think that it needs to return home to the operator. Uh, there's just so many interesting things that are out there. NASA's building a, uh, a air traffic control system that would be able to determine uh, where drones are located, who's flying them, where the operators are. You know, there's a lot of very uh, great people out there that are using the technology in the right way, but there's always going to be that, that bad actor out there that's, that's doing something stupid with it. You know, like these wildfires in California, people have been flying over them and making it difficult for, for first responders to, to put them out. And those are the people that I think the technology has to be developed for to where either uh, they're held more accountable for flying in these areas or at the same time, um, you know, they understand the consequences that they're getting into when they're using them. The, the other thing that we keep hearing about now are these uh, people are taking drones and they're flying over prisons and they're dropping contraband in these prisons because, like, you know, you can fly these things mile, you know, miles away now and just drop, you know, drop something in there. And so for, with every yeah. great technology, there's always you know, bad actors so, out there. Someone's going to figure something out. Yeah. yeah. Another question. Maybe back there. Hi. Um, so how large are these drones? How much do they cost? And are they armed? The ones that you were using, were they armed? And if not, why weren't they armed? Like, why would you send in a team rather than just if the drones are armed, like they make it seem in the movies, why not just uh, uh, send in an armed drone to eliminate the target? So one of the reasons, what you'll find actually in the book is we, we really don't talk about drone strikes a lot. And that's because terrorists are worth more to us alive than they are dead. We would rather capture them because they can provide us a ton of information. If we just, you know, launched a Hellfire missile at that, that terrorist, like, he goes away. And that, okay, that's great. But we don't necessarily, we can't necessarily glean information from that. And so a lot of the stuff we were doing was we were there to try and capture it. And that's why we'd send guys on the ground to kick down the door with the intent of capturing them. But again, a lot of the people we're going after, they want to go out with a fight. And so there's, there's that situation to deal with. But yes, all the drones that I had were all armed. They were all armed because it's all about making the, a decision uh, you know, at, at the right moment of what you need to do. If that target's gonna get away or if, that, uh, if, if we can't, if it's gonna put the guys on the ground uh, in jeopardy by going after it, then we will choose to, to conduct a strike because in the end that, that will save lives. But there are reasons for also having flying drones without Hellfire missiles on them. And, a lot of times, like one of the reasons, sometimes we would take, well, a good example is in Baghdad. At, at, at the end of 2010, we weren't conducting drone strikes in the middle of Baghdad. It would be crazy for us to do that. So we removed the missiles from our drones, which allowed, which allowed us more flight time in the air. So it gave us like four to five more hours of flying that drone in the air because we lightened the payload on it. So little things like that would be reasons why you don't have it, but we pretty much always had the pick of the litter when it came to drones. And they're probably about as big as, I don't know, about two thirds of this room. I mean, they're, they're, they're big aircraft. And how much do they cost? One of those? Predators, you know, I, I think the black market rate maybe is a, a million, a million a piece, and you can't just buy one, you gotta buy three. You know, so, and it's US government rules. Uh, Reapers, I think, are around like four or five million. That's, yeah, they got that stuff online. Yeah. Well, um, let's come to right there in the middle. Just, we'll get you a mic. Do we have another mic? Right here. All right, just stand up and speak loud. Uh, first, I want to say thanks for your service. Thanks. And, uh, thanks for your willingness to speak about a controversial issue these days. Um, can you speak to the sort of separation of duties between the intelligence community, like the civilian intelligence community, so the CIA and NSA versus the DOD, um, like there's been some controversy as far as like should the CIA have the ability to, con to conduct uh, weaponized warfare? Um, so what do you see as the trend, like are, are sort of the responsibility of weaponized drone usage, is that going to be in the DOD sector going forward? Or do you think the CIA is still going to maintain that responsibility? I thought uh, probably about a year ago that the CIA would lose the responsibility for uh, conducting drone strikes because they're a collection agency. I mean, that's the, the intelligence, they, they collect. So people say like, why are they taking out these targets? But recently in the news, you'll see that the current director keeps talking about wanting to increase their use of them. So I don't know if they'll ever give up that control necessarily, but DOD has always had um, the most uh, assets 
uh, to drone, you know, drones that are out there doing this, these things. I think DoD is probably, uh, probably more uh, proficient at it uh, because there's a, a larger amount of people that are involved in it, uh, more funds available also for them to, to do that. Um, so I don't necessarily know if uh, we'll ever see the day when uh, both those organizations are not in some capacity using, using drones. But you know, the NSA, NGA, you know, CIA, those are largely collection agencies. Those are the guys that would feed people like me information, and then I would put it all together and make sense of it. And maybe I would go to them and I would say, hey, I need, I need a certain piece of information. Figure out, can you figure out how to get it for me? And they'd come back magically with that information, which is great. Um, and then I would be the guy that had to do something with it. Um, but without each of those organizations, without them working together also, I mean, we wouldn't be where we are today with, with, with all this counterterrorism work. Well, it's really remarkable. And as you describe it, um, well, let me quote General Hayden, who will be here, by the way, in December. So <laughs> I'll plug an upcoming program. But he <laughs> says, a must read for anyone who wants to understand the new American way of war. And it, it really is. And it does take us inside. Um, these extraordinary technology, the integration of this technology into the battlefield, and the work of all the agencies you mentioned. So um, I want to thank Brett Velikovich, drone warrior, and he'll be outside with his books. And uh, really, thank you very, very much. Thank you.